Welcome back to the Midnight Hour. You're here with a man named Jack, and we are playing Final Fantasy VII. Bit, wait, this is Bit? Wait, this is Biggs? I thought Biggs was the fat one. Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait. Oh, God, no, Wedge was the fat one. Wedge is Murray. Biggs is the leader. We're gonna pull out now. Meet up at the meet up at the hideout. We're gonna pull out now. Meet up. Hey, hey, man. We're gonna pull out now. Meet up at the hideout. Oh, God, that's Biggs' voice now. I'm sorry. That's what it is. We'll we'll all meet up. We'll all meet up at the hideout, man. Man, Cloud, we're we're counting on you to blow up the actor. Oh God, I fucking hate it, but I can't I can't change it now. That's just what it is. It's kind of like the Slippy voice. It doesn't matter if I hate it. That's it's been cemented. So, one curious thing that I noticed is that, um, it preserves your action bar percent between combats, I think? So their, their action bars keep filling up during the end fanfare. We'll see if... Ooh, antidotes. Oh, there are the antidotes. I'm gonna get poisoned. I know, this, this game might not have done that. Just because, man, there's... It's, it's so weird to play a game that's this old. Because in the 20 years since... Uh, since this game was made, like, obviously there's increases in graphics and memory and com computational power and storage, you can get autosaves, you can get, like, better graphics, but more important than that, I think, is that game developers kind of found a set of standards for the best way to guide players through games that just didn't exist when a lot of these old games came out. Like, some games just, either through luck or brilliance, landed on the perfect ideas to make a game optimal, and some games didn't. And it's not a problem if a game didn't perfectly have the best guide through. And, like, for, for an example for that, in, in Banjo-Kazooie, uh, there were, like, the big puzzles were the music notes, right? Not, big puzzles were the golden bananas, the smaller, yeah, the smaller collectibles were the music notes, but the music notes weren't there to be hard to find, the music notes were there to guide you through the levels, the music notes formed paths that would show you where you needed to go to find locations of interest, and in Donkey Kong 64, also a rare game, you get the exact same thing, you get the golden bananas are... <coughs> You get golden bananas as the large collectible puzzle reward that drive the game, but you also have smaller rewards in the form of bananas that will kind of guide you through the level a little bit and draw your eye and lead you to interesting places. And that is a really fucking great thing for a puzzle platform. If you want an example of how bad it is to not have that, Ukulele, which was supposed to be a revitalization of that genre, their quills that they have you collecting do not act as guides. The quills are hidden throughout the level, and some of them are hidden too well, and that is the exact opposite of what those should do. Now, again, as you'll probably say, Ukulele is a more recent game. Shouldn't they have learned this by now? Yes, Yooka-Laylee should have known how to use the quills because Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64 had already showed them how to use the quills, how to use those small collectibles in the best way. <coughs> but this was 20 years ago, and a lot of those standards for video game, not etiquette, but design, like a lot of the standards for best video game design just weren't standard because no one had had those ideas yet. So, like with any game that's this old, it's fascinating to go back and to just 
Like, playing these older games, you get to see what the mindset of the developers were at the time. Because they didn't have a rule book. They didn't have a guide They were just putting together the game that they thought would work well. And a lot of these old games work really well because of that. Some of them don't. It's just, it's just how, how close that developer's ideas for what is good line up with what is actually good for a game. And on that note for good game development, this is, this, this map is pretty clearly a recolor of the previous map. I'm willing to bet that that's, I don't know how this is stored, like this might be a completely different background, or it might just be a recolor that takes up less space on the hard drive. But in addition to that saving memory, if it does, it's the same power plant, just in a different location. It would make sense for it to be the same shape. Like, this elevator is definitely the exact same. <coughs> so that's, that's pretty cool. Box. Uh, I'll, I'll stop talking about video game design for a little bit. Video, ga video game design 101. If you're going to make a game, go find other people who have made the same kind of genre. Look at what they did that worked, and look at what they did that not that didn't work, and learn from the mistakes of your predecessors. Oh, we're getting mad. But if you're building a game that has no predecessors, something like Snake Pass, just fucking go with it and do what you can. Which, oh man, I should record some Snake Pass just because it's a lovely, wonderful game. Like, it's unfortunate that I don't like Snake Pass, but it is a, a lovely game that I want to show off sometimes. I can have Tifa and Browns, that's good. But, to, 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 to explain for anyone who doesn't know, Snake Pass is a game where you play as a snake. You have no arms and no legs, and your movement, it's, it's a puzzle platformer, and your movement is literally as a snake, and the game has a... From what I can tell, entirely unique attempt <coughs> to have a snake's movement transcribe into a gamepad. And I personally have one really big disagreement with how they did it. Like, it works so well for almost everything, but there's one uh, control label grip where instead of having the snake actually grip, it just makes the snake's back half go limp. Which, like, snakes are really fucking agile. Like, they are muscular. Like, a good tree climbing snake is good at climbing trees. Climbing anything in Snake Pass was just made incredibly difficult because of the fact that you could not grip with the muscles that I wanted to grip. And it it came so close to being one of my favorite games ever, but that one control decision just really ruined it for me. And I like I tried to like it, but I couldn't pass that. And I love snakes, and I love the idea of snake pass, and I'm not mad at the money I spent on it. I'm glad I spent the money on it because I like I, I like rewarding new ideas. My favorite kind of game is one that catches me off guard with something I've never experienced before. And Snake Pass did that. Just not... It, it could have been better, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. No one had made a game that you play as a snake with that kind of control scheme for, so they just took a stab in the dark, like, we think that this will work well, and we can play test it, but we won't know how the players react to it until the game is out. And, like, something like a core movement like that, I don't know if they would be able to patch that to alter it at all. I know at one point they did add a simplified mode, which instead of like having to weave back and forth with the control base. Instead of weaving with the control stick, you just press a direction, but that takes all the charm out of the game. What was that deadly race I just got? Uses bio level two on all opponents. Cool. Consumable magic weapon. Initial equipped long range weapon. Ah got a tent. Cool. Restores mana points by a hundred, restores health by a hundred. Okay. Ah. Uh. Range, field. <coughs> oh, 
Okay, that is an Alice Orb. Alright. Uh, magic, Tifa, go ahead and cure Cloud. Okay, cure heals more than a potion. I don't know how much, but it heals an amount. Berries low on magic, but that's fine. For now. Okay, so I'm guessing that elevator is the way out after everything is excluding, which we'll need a quick way out once that happens. Uh, I wish ukulele had been better than it was. Like, I, I wish, I wish when they made that game, they had copied more notes from Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, because... I love those games so much. I love that style. I, I, I love the puzzle platformers. A, because I like puzzles. A, because I like puzzles. And B, because adding the platformer in the puzzle platformer just works really well. Like, it's... It, they're, they're like a... They're like open-world portal games. No, not really. But I, I love that genre. And that genre doesn't exist anymore. And ukulele was supposed to be an attempt to revitalize that genre, but instead what probably happened is developers looked at all the problems ukulele had and said, look, it didn't sell well, it wasn't received well. If this was supposed to be a fan favorite and the fans hated it, we're not going to try to make a puzzle platformer because it'll go poor. And like, again, I'm just making a wild guess based on what I know of game corporations, but I I find it incredibly hard to believe that a game company would roll the dice on what is considered to be a dead genre, especially when the attempt to revitalize that genre just fell flat over both left feet. It really is a shame. Ah, but that's all the time I have for this episode. Next time on the Midnight Hour, I'll actually talk about the game that I'm playing.